Hello, everyone. Good evening. Can you believe it's the middle of July already? We're glad that you joined us this evening. Welcome to the first of two programs in our summer series, partnering with Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie as they celebrate their 25th anniversary. Medewin has the distinction as the first space in the entire country designated a national tall grass prairie by law in 1996. If you are new to the Chicago Council on Science and Technology, we are a 14-year-old non-for-profit organization with the mission to enhance the public's understanding and appreciation for science and technology and their impact on society. You can visit www.c2st.org to get information about C2ST's upcoming programs or to learn how you can support future programs. Remember to sign up for our mailing list so that you can get reminders about these upcoming programs as well. Anytime during the program, you are welcome to ask questions. Please type c2st2.cnf dot io into your web browser and click today's session to ask questions and evaluate the program at the end our staff will also be checking c2st tv on youtube and facebook live for your questions there again to ask questions directly please go to c2st2.cnf.io so on to the program we are so excited to have three dedicated volunteers join us this evening. Um, they're going to share some of the reasons that we are so excited to showcase this largest open space in Northeastern Illinois. First, we'll have Greg Dubras, whose contributions at Medewin include construction projects, photographing special events, interpretive services for both children and adult programs and tours, ecological monitoring, specifically for birds. There are some unique species of birds found only in Medewin. Greg is also the vice president and program director of Will County Audubon and is active in projects for Illinois Audubon. Then we'll hear from Ron Capala, who has volunteered in restoration with the Mighty Acorns, tour guide assistant, tour guide, and bison ranger. And he insists in other Medewin programs, both in person and virtually, like this evening. And then finally, we would like to welcome Dr. Christina Samet, who was drawn to this volunteering opportunity by the inspiring mission of the Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie to heal and restore almost 20,000 acres of this unique prairie ecosystem. Christina has participated in volunteer activities such as interpretive programs and ecological monitoring. We, again, are delighted to have you all. And Greg, we will start the story with you. Thank you, Dawn. Well, for all of you that are tuning in this evening, welcome to Medewin Prairie 101. Medewin is actually a unit of the U.S. Forest Service, which is a division of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Now, you don't necessarily think of a uh, national grassland as being part of the forest, <clears throat> excuse me, as being part of the Forest Service, but that's what we are. As Don mentioned, Medewin was established uh, by law, federal law, in 1996. In the early 90s, the, um, the Army decided that the Medewin property that had been for, uh, since 1940, had been a, uh, a, an arsenal. They decided that that land was no longer needed, and the Illinois Land Conservation Act was, was written by uh, U.S. Congress and signed into law in early 1996. Now, the name Medewin is actually derived from the indigenous tribe of Potawatomi uh, peoples, and it was a word they used for their Grand Medicine Society, or think of it as their Healing Society. I guess you could think of it as their Amer American Medical Association at the time. At Medewin, we like to think that we are healing the land through multiple types of restoration, and 
We also like to think that we as people are being healed by Medewin as we do the uh, restoration work uh, together. So as part of the Illinois Land Conservation Act, uh, Laura, you can advance the slide now, please. As part of the, Illo the Illinois Land Conservation Act, there were four purposes that were established for Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie. And the first one is uh, that Medewin will manage the land and water resources of the prairie in a manner that will conserve and embrace, enhance the native populations of wildlife and plants. And re restoration at Medewin is not just planting native plants, because in the pre-arsenal days, wetlands, thousands of acres of wetlands, as a matter of fact, were drained for agriculture. And to support the arsenal operations, which came into effect in 1940, more than 1,400 buildings were erected, 200 miles of paved road, 166 miles of railroad were built, in addition to 392 steel reinforced concrete bunkers uh, were built to store explosives explosives and ammunition. So there's a lot of work to do when restoration is going to take place to get back to the point where then we can start planting native plants. Now the second purpose for Medewin was for research and education. Medewin provides many types of opportunities for scientific, environmental, and land use education and research. And this education spans all the way from grade school age children to university level students and, and post-grad types of uh, projects as well. Okay, Laura, thank you. Now, you might not think that agriculture would be part of the plan at Medewin, but it certainly is. The uh, overall plan for Medewin is to continue with agricultural use of the lands within uh, the Medewin property for uh, years to come. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, that part of the mission of Medewin in just a second. Laura, you can go ahead. And the fourth and final purpose of Medewin per the legislation is for recreation. And Ron, in just a few minutes, will give you a lot more detail on all of the different kinds of recreational activities that take place at Medewin. Okay, Laura. So a little bit back to the agricultural twist that we were talking about a moment ago. Allowing crop production provides some income actually for Medewin. There are hundreds of, hundreds of acres of pasture and row crops that will someday have to be converted back to tall grass prairie. But in the interim, we at Medewin and the land at Medewin is um, benefited in a number of ways. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Laura, thank you. So by keeping the uh, pasture lands and row crop lands in production with cattle grazing the pastures and row crops, for instance, uh, uh, soybeans and corn in, in uh, production, that helps to control invasive plants. And these would be non-native invasive plants that we don't want to have to deal with in the years to come. So having those agricultural practices help keep that all under control. Laura? Also, it helps, uh, the agriculture helps in the early stages of restoration be because of the use of herbicides to rid the, the grounds that are being uh, in the early stages of restoration that are being restored. For instance, one of the very first things that is done for a parcel of land to be restored is to um, is to use herbicides to to kill all the vegetation. And remember, these, these areas would be um, uh, either pasture land, non-native grass for pasture land, or um, uh, uh, areas that have just been let go and, and are just fallow. Those areas are herbicided, and then row crops are put in, and the production of the row crops uh, the normal pra agricultural practices of the row crops then prevent the new growth of the unwanted plants while still growing soybeans or corn, for instance, for uh, um, uh, for use, uh, normal use. Laura? 
So a little more detail about Illinois, which ironically has been called the prairie state for many years. As you can see on this map, the yellow area is pre-European settlement um, tall grass prairie lands. The green, of course, is forest lands. Well, at that time, approximately 22 million acres were prairie. That's what the yellow is on the uh, map that you're seeing. Of course, in the early 1800s, when settlers started moving in from the east and moving westerly into the southern region of Illinois, uh, they actually thought because of for previous experience with Indiana, Ohio, Southern Ohio, Pennsylvania, the, where they had been in uh, generations past, they had not experienced these grasslands like they were experiencing in Illinois. And they assumed that since there were no trees growing in all this, these yellow areas, that the soil must not be any good. Well, of course, we've learned uh, just the exact opposite in, in uh, later years. Another really big invention that, that uh, created a boom in agriculture was the invention of the steel plow, and that was actually in Lockport, Illinois in the mid-1830s. The, the settlers in the um, earlier times in Illinois found that their normal wooden types of, of uh, agricultural implements could not break the uh, prairie soils because of the root structure of the native plants was so deep and so tough. But after the invention of the steel plow, well, it was great invention at the time, but uh, we actually turned Illinois into, into an agricultural state. And today there is less than one tenth of 1% of the original prairie remaining. That's how little has not been plowed under and used for agricultural purposes. If you look very closely at the top uh, third, I'll even say the top fourth. Oh, thank you. I see someone's bringing in a pin. Okay, right there where there's a circle being drawn, that represents how much of the original prairie exists in Illinois. What used to be yellow uh, pre-European settlement has now been reduced to that little square. And of course, it's not that little square specifically. It is a conglomeration of uh, small little parcels that might be cemeteries, railroad rights of way, those types of little bits and pieces spread scattered throughout what used to be the prairie. If you put, pack those all together, that's what's left is that tiny little block. Farming at Medewin increased until 1940 when the Army started purchasing properties and constructed what would eventually become the Joliet Arsenal. So I'm going to turn over the show now to Ron, who's going to give you more detail. Go ahead, Ron. Thanks, Greg. Uh, first, we'll start uh, more at uh, the Welcome Center, which is located uh, on the east side of Route 53, oh, about a uh, mile close a mile north of uh, uh, North uh, River, uh, Kankakee River Road uh, in uh, Jackson Township, and in Wilmington Township. There's several townships covered in this area. Presently, uh, due to COVID restrictions, the Welcome Center is closed, but uh, normally uh, you go in there, there's uh, a little bookstore there, uh, some t-shirts available, and there's a lot of displays about the history of uh, the Medewin background uh, from uh, geologic to past uh, up until present. Uh, across from the, the uh, Medewin uh, Welcome Center, across Route 53, uh, there's a scope available. We can watch uh, uh, bald eagles uh, active nests. Uh, this year it's been active also. Uh, but uh, the present, like I said, this presently it's closed. But uh, recently, in order to help with the visitors, uh, they installed the intercom with a, a computer monitor so they can communicate back and forth, give directions to visitors, uh, see what's um, available, uh, where they're going from, uh, where they're at. So uh, that was installed, uh, like I said, just recently. Okay, and Laura, next one. Uh, Medellin offers many 
many uh, opportunity uh, for uh, recreation. As you can see in the diagrams or the slide here, there's uh, biking, horseback riding, uh, hunting, trail um, walking, and um, snow skiing. Biking, you bring your own bike, but uh, recently with a, with an agreement with the i &M, uh, Heritage, uh, Canal Heritage Society, they installed two uh, bike sources, one at the White, uh, Welcome Center and one at the, the Iron Bridge Trailhead. Uh, before you leave the Welcome Center, uh, you can maybe pick up some uh, trail maps and other brochures about maybe wildflowers, birds, maybe insects uh, in the area. At the Welcome Center and also all the trailheads, these are available outside, so pick uh, re readily available for pickup. Laura here is showing our, our trail map, which is, uh, this one's in English. There's also one in, uh, available in Spanish. We have uh, six major trailheads up on the right-hand side of the, the map is uh, our Waponzi uh, trailhead. It connects with uh, Will County Forest Preserve uh, Waponzi Trail from Joliet down to Essex. And you can access a couple of our trails from this uh, site. You're going farther east, uh, make two or three miles, you come to the, the Huff Road uh, trailhead. It's on Huff Road at Chicago Road. Access to more of our trails, a, a little parking area there. South of there, about a mile, is Turtle Pond, a little recreational area with the bathroom facilities and some picnic uh, facilities. It, it's a small man-made pond. Okay, from there, we can go farther east to Route 53 and head south uh, to uh, our Iron Bridge Trailhead, which is probably the most popular trailhead uh, on, on the property. Access is right off Route 53. There's a fairly large parking lot. You have access to uh, the east side and west side of uh, the day one from this trailhead. Uh, on the maps uh, shown which are available for biking, which are biking or multi-use trailers, biking, horseback riding, or uh, just walking. Some of the trails uh, are exclusively for walking. We have uh, maybe over 30 miles of trails and about eight of them are exclusive for uh, just uh, hiking. And also from this uh, Iron Bridge Trailhead, just south of it uh, is uh, about a thousand acres of our bison pasture. Okay, heading south along for 53, maybe about a mile from Iron Bridge on the west side is um, Explosive Roads Trailhead, which has access to uh, another trail, the Henslow Trail, and a lot of part of the west side. Basically, on the west side, except for the Henslow Trail, which is multi-use, everything else is a, a walking trail. Okay, from the Explosive Road, we can head south to uh, oh, maybe about three miles and come to the Visitor Center area, which is uh, another trailhead, which is op open recently. It parallels Route 53 and goes all the way north uh, to uh, the Henslow Trail, which is close to... Uh, the Iron Bridge Trailhead. Our next trailhead is uh, just a little bit south and then west on River Road to uh, Boathouse Road. And you go a little bit, uh, maybe a quarter of a mile north, and that's our trailhead heading toward uh, different areas, uh, mainly walking except for the Henslow Trail. Okay, uh, next slide, Laura. There are, like I said, uh, 30 miles of trails. Uh, eight of them are just walking. 22 miles are shared trail. Uh, there is a little priority of uh, who gets the right of way. First, the horses get the right of way, uh, followed by bikes, and then walking last. But uh, just like in an automobile, whoever gets the right of way, just common sense uh, governs. Okay. With uh, shared trails, uh, you know, like I said, the good etiquette is, is uh, good, uh, is a good practice. Here's a little site on the Henslow uh, Trail, just on the west side, not too far from Explosive Road. Even though a lot of the 
Medea when it's not uh, restored, you could still see some grand vistas at different parts of, of the area. Uh, just uh, unique at this location on a queer day, just looking the way they are, you could see uh, um, Commonwealth Edison's nuclear power plant, which is kind of the new with the old being restored. Same with uh, far east side, close to the Wabanzi Trail there. Uh, you can see uh, Brabo nuclear recreation area in the distance. On the next slide, uh, this is showing you that on your trail map, you can see all the trail areas, what's open area and what's closed area. So you're encouraged to use any, uh, and explore any open area that's on the site. If you have a horse or, or a dog on a leash, you, we ask that you, you do remain on the, the trails itself, but otherwise you feel to free to explore the open prairie. Uh, you might see, you want to come and see a prairie in bloom. Uh, the prairie really does uh, start blooming late uh, June and goes through mid to late September. And you may come once, twice, and really come every couple of weeks if you can. Uh, there's always something new uh, popping up in the prairie uh, blooming cycle. When you're walking through here, you you find different uh, hidden ponds and streams. Uh, we'll find out later how many, uh, there's a five streams flow through the day one. This one is on the west side, it's a button bush pond. Or in the next one, please. A name for a, a bush that grows in, in the wet areas along the pond. This is the flowering, uh, the flower of the button bush. Uh, it started really blooming a couple weeks ago and blooms maybe through mid to late August. Some uh, say, well, they're little satellites, but bringing it up to date, uh, they look like little COVID cells to me. So Laura, next. Any time of year, uh, you can come and explore. Uh, this is a, a bridge over uh, the Prairie Creek on the west side again. Uh, we have uh, probably access to Prairie Creek, maybe four or five different places uh, throughout the site on the east and west side. Different bridges are available. There's one on the east side, a Bailey Bridge, which was a, a portable bridge used by the military during the war. And uh, it was reconstructed here and put over Prairie Creek. And, and uh, part of the reconstruction team were, were gentlemen who were in the war and actually did construct uh, that Bailey Bridge in the field. And uh, next slide. Okay, on uh, your, I said the prairie starts in June, but you no, know, late March to uh, mid June, uh, a lot of the spring ephemerals are uh, shown in the, the various parts of the wooded area. This is on the west side, which I think Christine will be talking about later. Okay, Laura. Okay, during uh, the year, there are uh, uh, several uh, hunting seasons available. Um, let me see, through, uh, from October through January, there's deer hunting season. It's all bow and arrow, except uh, one or two weekends where uh, muzzle-loaded shotguns are allowed. Regular uh, state licenses are required, but also you need a day one permit to hunt uh, on the property. It's best to contact the, the main office uh, for information on how to get in the permit and uh, what else is required. And in uh, the spring, there's also a turkey license. Uh, hunters are required to uh, stay off the trails by a required uh, minimum distance, but during hunting season, it's also available or advisable that you should wear uh, bright colored clothes when walking on the trail. When walking on the trail, who knows what you might see. Uh, we have a picture from the right, uh, left, it's going clockwise, you see a bobolink, great, uh, a horned owl, an egret, leopard frog, and also some deer. So any place you may find something, you just have to be at the right place at the right time to see anything. Next slide. While walking through uh, these trails, the day one has a, a, a very diverse path. So you might see farm stand, you might see 
uh, remnants of old farms. You might see remnants of the arsenal, just like you do see here, an uh, old fire hydrant next to an old farm uh, building uh, foundation. And then uh, next slide, uh, this is probably our, our the Madewan's oldest resident. It's a bur oak tree. Uh, it's never been a uh, core to see how actually old it is, but it's, it's estimated to be uh, older than uh, the United States itself. It really has a circumference of uh, 19 feet. Uh, which is, makes a pretty large tree. The largest uh, bur oak tree in Illinois has a circumference of 24 feet. So I think Christine will be talking about this in a little while also. Okay, next slide. Uh, as you're uh, walking uh, through these forest, uh, forested and non-forested area, this is an old foundation or, or the wall of a, a dairy that existed prior to the arsenal being constructed. It's uh, way north, uh, probably about two and a half mile walk from uh, the River Road uh, parking area up to uh, Blodgett Marsh Trail, but it's well worth a walk. So after we leave the Welcome Center, we can go head south back onto uh, West on River Road up onto uh, Boathouse Road. And this is where uh, Christine and, uh, will help you out taking you on some more of the tour. Hear me? Great. So now we are traveling from the, the better known parts of the park to the lesser known parts of the park. So everybody who comes to Medellin usually GPSs it to the Welcome Center, and then everybody's here to see the bison, they go to the Iron Bridge Trail. What we're doing today is taking you to a little bit off the beaten path to the west side of the park. And this is actually my favorite part of the park and it's really fun to explore it and it's really fun to bring your friends and family here. It's, it's a little bit difficult to find at first. So what you need to do is travel from the Welcome Center south on Route 53, which you can tell your friends is uh, the southbound lanes of Route 53 is historic Route 66. So actually, if you were to continue on straight, you'd end up in Los Angeles eventually. Uh, but what we're gonna do is turn right on River Road and then travel um, travel down to the, um, over the, tr the, the train tracks. And these train tracks actually are um, the very same train tracks that carried Abraham Lincoln in his funeral train. Um, that's actually part of the reason why the um, the National Cemetery that we have adjacent to Medellin is called Abraham Lincoln National Cemetery. That's actually the place where Abraham Lincoln funeral train paused for people to pay respects. And so you're going to travel over those train tracks and then find a sign, a very inconspicuous sign that says Boathouse Road, indicating Boathouse Road to the left. You're using that as a wayfinder to turn right into exactly this little gravel road here. And what you see here is actually um, a small sign that says U.S. Forest Service uh, Trailhead and Parking. And then there's a um, cattle guard there, which I'll explain in a minute why we have that cattle guard. It's very important to keep this area free of munching deer. You go to the next slide. So you go down this gravel road to uh, just, just a few hundred feet, and you'll see a, um, a sign like you see here. And at the moment, it probably doesn't look like much, but this is actually the real heart of restoration at Medellin. So you can park right here off to the side, or you can go a little bit further to a slightly larger parking lot and walk back. And so this is actually the location of our largest seed bed. So the Medellin actually has three locations where we manufacture and generate seed in order to restore the prairie. Um, one of them is located at the visitor center, so that's a great place to actually see a seed bed. There's another one at Turtle Pond, which is off of the Hoff Road trailhead. If you take Hoff Road to um, Old Chicago Road and park there, you can walk down to the Turtle Pond and see a seed bed. But the largest is actually here at the um, Prairie Creek Woods Trail at the River Road trailhead, and we'll we'll uh, explain to you you know how how this works and what you know what we're doing in this area. Next slide. So this is what it looks like probably in this picture, doesn't really look like much, but it's actually thousands of hours of volunteer work and the, the real 
um, success behind this park is really whether they're able to generate the plants that actually can restore the prairie. So in order to, um, so the, the Medewin is attempting, the, the Forest Service and the volunteers are attempting to restore up to 200 acres of prairie a year. And to, and this is very many, uh, up to 150 to 170 species of plants, which are not easily sourced through growers, certainly not in the volumes that we need them, and they're very expensive. And so uh, a, a simple, um, you know, uh, 30 to 40 species um, seed mix for just, just a small amount of acreage can cost up to like 15 hundred dollars. And so we're trying to, re to restore up to 200 acres a year. And so the cost of actually generating or purchasing that seed would be around 300 to $400,000 a year. And so these seed beds are actually planted by Forest Service staff and volunteers. Um, the seeds are planted, the plants grow, and then the, the, the seeds are harvested and dried and, and replanted, either cast or they're actually planted in plugs and the, the plugs or the small seedlings are actually planted. And so it's a really beautiful place to visit because there is something blooming all times of the year because there's are all different types of species. It's like a little prairie zoo. You can go in and, and observe all different types of flowers. There's actually even a, in the app, which is part of the Forest Service um, on-cell um, uh, application that you can get on your phone, you can actually identify which seed beds have which species. And you could take one of our brochures, which actually identify the prairie flowers or the, the most common ones, and you can find them at different types of the year. And so it's really fun because you can you can really see a lot in one visit. And there's also, it attracts a lot of very interesting insects and caterpillars and butterflies and moths and a lot of birds. And so it's a great little place to go. It takes no walking and you get to see a lot in one visit. You can go to the next slide. So the, um, the seed is harvested um, by the Forest Service and the volunteers. It's actually also partially harvested by um, what was mentioned earlier, the Mighty Acorns program, which is for children who are in the fourth to fifth grade. They actually go through a process of learning about prairie restoration where they come uh, in the wintertime and, and the springtime in the fall. And each time they learn about different uh, they learn about insects, they learn about birds, they learn about ponds, and then they also, they gather seed, they, in one visit, they plant it in uh, a tray that has plugs, then a seedling grows, and then they come back and they plant the seedling, and they have their own um, field that they're restoring. And so it's, it's a very educational and interesting, um, interesting program that we have for, for children, and I think Ron is one of our um, very consistent volunteers with it, Mighty Acorns. And so this is, um, one of the you know the, the really fascinating parts of this park you know how the the amount of effort that it takes to actually restore 200 acres takes you know hundreds of, of people's time and it's primarily volunteer led the seeds are taken from these seed beds and they're taken into our horticultural building if you've ever been to the um the visitor center the horticultural buildings uh in the same co-located with the visitor center and there they're dried and cleaned and stored and then possibly planted into plugs or made into seed mixes. So the prairie across the park, which is almost you know eighteen thousand acres, is not is not the same everywhere. In some areas, it's it's a wetter prairie. In some areas, it's drier. There's sand prairies and dolomite prairies, and so they need their own seed mix in order to for the the seeds to be successful. So you can't put the same seeds everywhere or the same plants everywhere. And so there are people who have figured out the ideal seed mixes. And so they do this in the horticultural building before it's, it's cast or put into um, seedlings. Go to the next slide. So this is an example of the prairie clone flower and uh, the, the, purple, the pale purple prairie clone flower, an early bloomer, very beautiful flower, one of my favorites. And you can see how, how luscious and delicious these <laughs> seed beds look. And that was the reason why we had the, um, the uh, cattle guard and actually that very large fence. Um, it, it's a very, it's, if you really wondered how, what it would take to keep deer out of your yard, go look at that fence. It's, it's enormous and it's, it's, it's encircling those seed beds so that they're not a deer buffet. And um, that, and it's a wonderful place to visit at almost all times of year. You can see a lot of, of the prairie plants and um, enjoy, you know, the different species. Go to the next slide. In this picture, you can actually see some of the, the um, beautiful 
um, productive seed bed here. Uh, the Indian grass is in the foreground with the light feathery kind of red color. And then you see the very common to us, the goldenrod in the, in, in the background. And you can explore these seed beds. There's 39 different seed beds. They're about a quarter mile long, split into two um, halves. And so there's, there's a very wide variety of species that you can appreciate if you visit here. The next slide. Okay, so we've, we've enjoyed the seed beds and you either then drive on to the large parking lot and park um, or just walk back to the trailhead. Uh, in this parking lot, there's actually a bathroom facility and there should be some information. Like I said, there might be the, um, the pamphlet for identifying the wildflowers. And then you have to get out of the deer fence at that point. So there's a really, there's a door and you're allowed to go in there. It probably feels at first like it's a little bit, um, maybe not allowed, but you can get through that deer fence. And then that takes you into the, inside the Prairie Creek Trail area. And you'll, you will um, come upon the, uh, the South Patrol Road, uh, which is an old army road. And so when you get past the deer fence and you walk, I don't know, um, two, 300 feet, the first thing you encounter on your right is the Henslow Trail. We're not gonna go that way today, but just so you know, the Henslow Trail is a multi-use trail. So it allows horses, bikes, and um, pedestrians, of course. And uh, so it's a multi-use trail that takes you all the way back across to the other side of the park to the east end of the park. And it has like a channelized canal running next to it. And it's a very pretty trail because you actually have a restored prairie along part of it. And uh, it's, it's, it's a really nice, um, if you like to bike or to, to ride. Uh, we're gonna keep going a little bit, another two, 300 feet to the north along what they call South Patrol Road. And a grass trail will appear on the left side and that's the Prairie Creek Woods Trail. I love this trail. It's very nice if it's hot because this is the only trail that's very well shaded in the park. And it is unique because it's forested partially, and there's a lot of um, a lot of interesting things to see along the way. It's grass at the beginning, and then as it gets into the woods, it's like kind of a wood chip. So it's a real nice jogging trail too. If you like to jog, it's real soft. Um, and so there's a wood chip that goes through the um, the, the Prairie Creek woods, um, and this is also a very um, interesting place to see uh, early and short blooming flowers. So they call them um, ephemerals. But in this picture, you actually can see the, uh, the woodland flocks there. If you see those, those purple, beautiful purple lavender type flowers, but there's all different types of flowers that actually bloom in this woods. And so it's worth a try in the spring to take a walk through there um, and, and enjoy these beautiful flowers. Go to the next slide. So about halfway through, so Prairie Creek Woods Trail is sort of like a Round, like a D-shaped loop going through the woods and about halfway along that loop, you come upon the button bush pond, which was mentioned earlier. Um, this is actually a former oxbow of the Prairie Creek that the army closed off and they created this small lake. Um, it's a fun place to see waterfowl. Uh, you obviously, you'll probably find the button bush there. Um, and I've actually seen a beaver here. So I, I've seen a lot of beaver activity too. So this is a really beautiful place. There's a lot of interesting trees and it's a nice little place to stop off. There's a deck you can um, look over the pond and take a break on your very short hike that you're doing here in the Prairie Creek Woods. Next, next slide. So once you come out of the forest, um, you're at the, top, the north side of Prairie Creek Trail you've joined back again with what's called South Patrol Road. So that's that army road that's still like semi-paved. And you come upon one of the, uh, the one of the crown jewels of, of Midday when at first it may not look like much, but this is a fully restored 500 acre wet prairie, wetland and wet prairie. And so um, the number of man hours and women hours and, and four staff hours and everybody that, that has gone into restoring this field is incredible. And it's a very healthy, vibrant prairie. Um, we call it the South Patrol um, Road Prairie. And um, it was originally a 500 acre farm and uh, about 400 acres of that was row crops. And then the other hundred were the farmstead and, and the, you know, the pastures. And um, there was a little bit remnant of, of wetland, wetland there. And so what was done is that they, they fully restored this 
Um, and it's, it's, it's really outstanding. And when you go there, you just can't believe how tall the grass is and you can't believe how it's so different than what you would expect. If you're thinking of prairies out in the West, it's just really incredible. You can't even walk through it. It's so, so tall and so dense and so fascinating. And the bird activity there is incredible. If you ever have a chance to go on one of Greg's bird tours, this is, he'll take you here. This is a very, very exciting place to do some bird walking, bird watching. And so, um, go ahead and go to the next slide. So this, the way that they, they recovered this land is interesting. So because it was a wetland and a wet prairie, it wasn't suitable for, far, for farming, at least from the perspective that there was water on the land. This was a previously glaciated area. So as the glacier came through this area and retreated, it sort of created a depression that allows water to collect. In a wetland, I guess it collects for um, most of the year and in a wet prairie it collects for at least the you know the growing part of the season and so it's unsuitable for crop and what the farmers at that time decided to do was to come up with a way to drain drain the water away and make it um, tillable and so the way that they did this is they uh, dug two to three foot channels by hand actually then they placed uh, these drain tiles inside and any, every person in the Midwest knows what a drain tile is because you probably have them in your yard. Um, basically, they are just ceramic pipe in sections. They're laid end to end. They're not actually um, mortared or, or really made, um, made to connect to each other. They're really just laid into the trench and it just creates like a path of re least resistance for the water. Um, you cover it back up with dirt and then the water will run down these tiles and drain the land. And then it usually is um, led to a, like a channelized canal or a channelized drainage ditch, basically. And then that will lead to wherever the watershed goes, like a local creek, river, something like that. And so it makes the land dry enough to grow, um, su sustainably grow crops. And so these drain tiles are uh, everywhere in the Medellin property because it was formerly farmed. And so in order to restore it to its natural state, the drain tiles had to be removed. And that's what they did at the Prairie Creek, um, the South Patrol Road Prairie. They, um, they removed these drain tiles, um, which were, it was a tremendous amount of work. I'm sure I was not there at the time when they did this, but it was a tremendous amount of work. And um, they now have a, a year long wetland and wet prairie um, and, and it's, it's, it's quite amazing that, that, you know, that they were able to actually restore this land and have it be, um, have it be a, uh, a, a re renewed to a wetland. So we can go to the next slide. So that's a view again of the South Patrol Road Prairie and you can actually see the standing water there. Um, and it's, it's part wet prairie and part wetland. And it, depending on the time of year, you'll see different things. This is a little bit early in the year, so it's, it's not blooming yet, but it's, it's a quite incredible site to go to. And it's very accessible. This is really, if you didn't take the Prairie Creek Woods Trail, which was about a mile, you could access this point on the, um, the South Patrol Road in, in half a mile. So it's, it's a very short, flat, very accessible point to actually see a, a fully restored wet prairie. We'll go to the next slide. And then we, we already had mentioned um, earlier about uh, the other very beautiful and important uh, site at the side of the park, which is our witness tree, which is a burr oak, um, which is a native species and, um, and treasured by uh, people who visit the Medewin. Large tree, this one, like Ron had said, is estimated to be around 300 years old. The witness tree gets its name from um, the surveyors who worked in these areas that were identifying landmarks that could uh, record property boundaries. And so trees of this type were allowed as landmarks, as witnesses to the location of property boundaries and the way that they would, uh, they would use them to measure distances and to record um, surveying activities. And so this tree is actually recorded. So as Ron said, it never has never been cored to actually get its real age through um, you know, that process. We know that it has to be a certain age because it shows up in the historical record. And so it's very well, um, very well known. It shows up with uh, the other witness trees in Illinois 
and it's um, it's a great, it's a beautiful uh, sight to see at the end of the Prairie Creek Trail. We can go to the next slide. Actually, it, it's so um, important to us that in 2018 on National Public Lands Day, which is a day where we get a lot of volunteers who don't normally come to the our park in, in particular, but they get together with their companies or with their schools and they come out on this one day and they do projects. And on the National Public Lands Day of 2018, the volunteers came and cleared all of the brush and invasives out from underneath the witness tree and in order to allow the visitors to enjoy it and appreciate it a little bit better, have a better idea of, of um, you know, its size and, and just to make it more accessible to everybody and to make it a nice landmark um, in this area of the park to finish off your little Prairie Creek uh, Woods Trail loop. You can stop at the witness tree um, and, and enjoy a little piece of history and a very important tree to our, to our um, beautiful Medewin. Okay, so that is the end of our Medewin Prairie 101 tour. And I hope you enjoyed it. We're at seven hour, 7.45ish. And I think I'm gonna turn it over to our host to discuss our, our question and answer session and also our future session on Medewin Prairie 101. I learned things that I told you I do that, Ron. Thank you so much. I am so grateful to hear that. There are things that I hadn't heard of before, and we do have a number of questions, so I'm going to jump right into it. And I think a good first question to ask would be, what does it cost to visit Medewin? <laughs> No charge. <laughs> oh, well, that's an easy one to answer. So it is free. Um, and I think a related question is, when will the vis uh, the Welcome Center open now that the state of Illinois is open? Do we have an idea of when that might happen? I, I believe it's, uh, it's, they're going by federal guidelines right now. So okay, with right. the Forest Service, the Department of Agriculture, correct me if I'm wrong, Laura, they are different proposals going through and uh, higher up, study them, revise and go back and forth. So it might be months, two, three months before the Welcome Center is open, I would guess. Yeah, However, yeah we don't we don't have a specific date yet, um, but like just like Ron said, we follow a little bit different guidance than the state. Um, so. We just have to take all those things into consideration and it, it, it'll probably be a couple of months or so. Let me ask a clarifying question. While the Welcome Center is closed right now, are guests able to visit Medewin? Is Medewin itself open and ready for all these activities? Absolutely, that's a great question. So our trails and parking lots um, are open seven days a week from 4 a.m. to 10 p.m. And we, those have stayed open uh, the entire time. At one point last summer, I believe we were the only outdoor space that uh, was still open. I remember some of the state parks were closed and uh, people were coming to Medewin in droves <laughs> to get out of their house. So yes, absolutely the trails and, and parking lots are open every day. Oh, good, thank you. Mm -hmm. So a question that was posed to you, Greg, um, are the crops and animals within Medewin owned by Medewin or are they private? The, uh, Laura can weigh in on this if I if I misspeak, but um, it, that land is leased. So farmers pay a lease fee to uh, pasture their cattle and they would pay some type of a lease arrangement with Medewin to plant to plant the crops. So it's just as if they were renting renting cropland or pasture land from another private owner, uh, but they're they're leasing land from the federal government in this case. Okay, thank you. I think a follow up question that wasn't posed, but I'm curious: Is there a plan to eventually turn all of it into natural prairie and phase out the farming, or is there a balance between the farming and the wetlands, so to speak? I'm not sure who's best suited to ask that. Laura, maybe? I'm looking at Laura. Sure, okay. yeah. So in, in the beginning stages, planning stages, I guess, um, of Medewin, um, after it was established, and of course we had to 
they had to come up with a plan. We have what's called the Medellin Prairie Plan. In that plan specifically, um, they have a number and the magic number is 100 years. So the hopes are that by 100 years, we'll have all of Medellin restored back to Prairie. Um, we're a quarter of the way there. So um, yeah, eventually it, you know, we're hoping that it would, it will all be tall grass prairie. Okay. Thank you. And Laura, this might be suited for you as well. And question from a viewers, what kind of research is conducted at Medewin? And I know that's probably a large question because there's a lot of different research projects. There's a lot of different research projects. One of the big, um, one of the big things, big projects that happen um, continuously on Medewin, which we actually didn't touch upon um, in this program is uh, monitoring, ecological monitoring. So that's kind of like how we know um, what we're doing is working or is it not working? So what I mean by ecological monitoring is um, we have staff and volunteers that go out and monitor birds, monitor insects. We have um, butterfly and dragonfly monitors. We have frog monitors. We have plant monitors. So those folks go out in the prairie and and just watch like what kind of birds are they seeing what kind of plants are they seeing um so that goes on continuously and we also have special projects that folks um you know from outside organizations or universities come and uh, want to do special studies so recently we had folks from olivet nazarene university come and do a bumblebee study and they found that i believe it's oh gosh it's either threatened or endangered i'm not sure but they found the rusty patched bumblebee at Medellin. Oh. So that was one of the really cool um, recent studies that was done um, at Medellin. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this question is for you, Ron. And I think perhaps during your talk, you might've partially answered it. The question was, there's hunting at Medellin. What can legally be hunted? And I heard you say deer. October to January and turkey in the spring. Correct. Were there any other animals that can be hunted? No, not at this time. No, fish, then, no fishing allowed either. Oh, okay, thank you. And in the spring, what are the months so I know when to wear orange? Uh, let me see, uh, Laura, maybe you can help me out on that. I, I'll help you out on that. <laughs> Turkey season, turkey season in this part of Illinois is pretty much the month of May. Excuse me, excuse me, I misspoke. Pretty much the month, the second half of April. Second half of April. Right. It, turkey, turkey is only hunted about uh, a total of four weeks in in the spring, and it starts sort of mid. Uh, sort of mid-April and extends into early May. Yep. Okay. And, and, at, and at Medellin, uh, on the east side, the turkey is hunted on the even days. On the west side, it's hunted on the odd days. So it's split up that way further. Oh, how fascinating. And I also heard the part, not only do you need to be licensed, you need a permit from Medellin. Correct. Interesting, really trying to work to keep that balance. Um, a question, I'm not sure who will be best suited. This question was, what makes Iron Bridge the most popular trail? Well, I, I can answer that in one word, bison. Okay, so that's the, is that the only trail in which you observe the bison? Well, it's, there's a, an east-west trail that runs along uh, the north perimeter of the bison pasture. And then, as Ron pointed out um, in his part of the discussion, there is a, um, uh, a relatively new trail that runs from Ironbridge Trailhead all the way back to the visitor center. And that borders the western uh, perimeter of the bison pasture. So I, I, I over, so I oversimplified a little bit on my one word answer, bison. That is a huge draw, but because that's where uh, that's the 
uh, one end of Henslow Trail, that uh, Ironbridge Trailhead provides a, um, uh, a access to the to the Henslow Trail. In addition to bison and access to the Henslow Trail, there is a, a, a what's called the Group 63 bunker field that's right there beside the Iron Bridge Trailhead. It runs to the east. So and then and then that provides you access with other part other trails that go to other parts of that side of Medewin. So it's it's really not just bison. It's just a lot of stuff. Um, either originates or terminates there at the Iron Bridge Trailhead. In addition to, uh, there is a um, an old farmstead there, which uh, uh, the foundations are still there for the home, the uh, a grain silo, a small dairy barn, and there's actually a whole tour that you can take that describes all the things that were going on at that farm and um, it, very interesting, very interesting part of Medewin. It, it kind of just, Iron Bridge Trail, it kind of brings it all together right there. Ah, so you come for the bison and stay for all the other amazing things that you see. Yeah, that's good. I wish I'd said that. Oh, goodness. I can't believe we're already um, close to out of time. There are a few questions that we didn't get to, and I feel pretty confident in saying that I'll be able to work with Laura to get some answers to those questions, and we will post them um, in C2ST um, underneath this feed. Maybe not this evening, but we will provide answers. And we really want to take this opportunity to let you know that we'll be doing the second part of this program next month on August 11th. Originally, this particular series, the Medellin 101 series, was something that incurred on site and it was a series of four different programs over four dates and so we're really grateful to have Laura and everyone work with us to condense this down to give us this quick overview of this space so there is lots more to come. I want to thank the audience for joining us this evening, thanking Ron, Greg and Christina for their valuable time and expertise. And also thank you to Laura for working behind the scenes. If you enjoyed today's program and you want to sponsor C2ST, please consider donating. And we also want you to give us feedback on this program so we can plan appropriately in the future. So if you would please go to C2 st2.cnf.io and evaluate the program, we would appreciate it. Other than that, we will see you next month, August, August 11th at 7 p.m. And if you can, sneak out to Medewin and see for yourself, and then you can ask informed questions next month. Again, thank you everyone for joining us. Have a lovely evening.